fall semester, which is packed with interesting, stimulating, uh, provocative uh, programs. So we hope that you'll take part in all of them starting today. Next week we go into high gear with the, our courses. And at the uh, end of the week, uh, Jill Doherty, uh, who is coming here from Moscow, uh, will have some news I'm sure we'll all be uh, eager to hear because she's, uh, she's been covering. Uh, Jill ha headed the uh, Moscow desk for CNN for a number of years. She's an expert on Russia and uh, has recently uh, finished a master's degree program. I don't know quite how she had the time to do it, but she did at Georgetown University on post-Soviet Russia and Putin. So stay tuned for that and the whole season. We're very, we're very pleased with it. Today we'll be discussing freedom and justice. People usually ask me what the theme is for the current university for a day. The fact is that we don't start with a theme, but we often end up with a theme. It evolves. It comes to pass organically as I invite various speakers into the fold. Today we start with our own freedom, which includes the responsibility for justice that freedom entails, and we end with justice for the world, a justice which, of course, implies freedom. As we embark on this one-day journey, we hope by the end of it you will sense a poetic justice, an aesthetic as well as an intellectual rationale for our creation, of which you are an integral part. The creation, if we call, can call it such, is the informed and energized give and take that will happen in this place at this time. We're deeply, deeply grateful to you that you have chosen to be an integral part of this creation, which is a give and take experience, an exchange, if you will, and in many ways a call to action. We're especially grateful to the Neighborhood Development Trust Fund and the Scranton Area Foundation for making this extravaganza of knowledge and fellowship available at an affordable price. And also, uh, we thank the, our state representative, Marty Flynn, who unsolicited sent us copies of the De Declaration of Independence. Uh, I remind you in advance that uh, you have in your packet an evaluation sheet. We uh, ask that you fill that out at the end of the day. It's important to us as we plan next year. For now, on to university of, for a day. And uh, to begin, I would ask Harmer Brereton, the, the founder, the, the first cause, to um, give a little reflection on um, our, our founding hero, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Father, Father uh, Shemmel. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, I'm tied in here. Go thank ahead. you, Sandra. Sure. First of all, thank you very much to the University of Scranton for allowing us to host this. And I express my gratitude to them, and especially for Sandra, who's done such an extraordinary job in arranging these programs. But for those of you that knew George, and for those of you that didn't, a short reflection might be helpful. He took Ignatian spirituality and Jungian psychology and married them in a most extraordinary way that those of us who were privileged to know him personally and the organizations that were privileged to have him with them uh, were transformed. And it's because of that remarkable talent that we celebrate his name. He was a brilliant man. He scored first in the national examinations when he went into the Jesuits, so we all know how smart he was. But I thought a less than two minute anecdote would tell you how much fun he was. George went everywhere, including Spain. And when he was at the rectory in Pamplona, there of course was the running of the bulls. So George said, I can do that. <laughs> and down the street he went, chased by all these very large bulls. Well, most of the people would jump over the fence and get away. A very small number would actually enter the bull ring. <laughs> but he was told if you stay very still, the bull can't see you and you'll be safe. <laughs> So George sat in the middle of the bull ring with one other person who turned to him and said, I'm the matador. <laughs> he said, but I'll take care of you. You go that way and I'll go this way. The bull will follow me and you'll make your escape. So at the appointed moment, off they went, but the bull didn't get the picture and he followed George. 
he caught George at the edge of the ring and actually gored him on the arm. Fortunately, the injury was mild, and George had it stitched up at the hospital and was back at the rectory that night, fully recovered. That was on Saturday, and on Sunday, he looked out the window of the rectory. The line of people waiting to get into the rectory stretched down the street and around the block. And George said, who are they? And the rector said, well, they're all here to see you. <laughs> and George said, why? And this man said, for a Spaniard to give his confession to a priest bloodied in the bullring is the greatest <laughs> honor he could have. <laughs> so for the next two weeks, George gave confession to everybody in Pamplona. So you see we have a tradition of entertainment here, that, uh, and I think that in very different ways you'll be entertained all day. But now I would turn the podium over to uh, Hal Bailey, our provost, who will introduce the first lecturer. All right, thank you, Sandra, and uh, thank you, Harmer. I'm, I'm sort of the cold water that prepares the rest of the day. I don't have a, a story like that to tell at all. Uh, but I do have a, a, a very brief story about another extraordinary man. Uh, uh, as, I, as I get into that, let me just uh, congratulate and thank Sandra and Harmer for the work they have done uh, uh, having, making today possible. Uh, the University for Day is, I, I think, a, a, a great contribution uh, to the University of Scranton and to the local community. So I thank uh, them and actually Sandra's committee for the work that they have done in bringing all this together. And, and I, uh, on behalf of the institution, I welcome you all to uh, uh, today's festivities. As I mentioned, uh, I, I have the honor of uh, very briefly uh, introducing another extraordinary man, our, our first speaker uh, this morning, Maury Myers. Uh, beginning with a uh, bachelor's degree at Syracuse, moving on to Yale Law, uh, what Maury then did was move on to an extraordinary uh, legal career, beginning with civil rights work that he did in the early 60s down south, uh, moving back to Scranton then uh, for a variety of, of government service, for a variety of local service. Uh, he was, for example, a, a member of, a key member of the Scranton Mafia that followed Bob Casey down to uh, Harrisburg. Uh, that, that led, uh, or actually was part of a whole series of significant uh, government committee work, both uh, state and federal, and I suspect as well as local, but I'm not sure about that, uh, that Maury did, uh, uh, and, and contributed in an extraordinary way uh, uh, to, Pennsylvania, to Pennsylvania governance. Uh, I also would note in particular that you have a thrill in front of you. Maury is a fabulous, fabulous teacher. Uh, all, many of you I know have already seen him. For many of you, that's why you're here. Uh, so I'll uh, wrap it up uh, very quickly so that you can get on to the main event this morning, uh, or actually one of two main events this morning. Uh, but, but Maury is sincerely committed uh, to three things, all of which sort of uniquely come together uh, in today's university for a day. Uh, he is committed to justice. Uh, the, what little I said about his career is only scratching the surface. Uh, he is deeply, deeply committed to justice, and he is uh, an independent thinker who, who uh, uh, figures this out on his own and stri strikes out uh, in important ways that he's carefully thought through. The second thing he's deeply committed to is education. Uh, that I think you'll have proven for you in just a moment. And the third thing, delightfully, that he is committed to is Sandra. Uh, <laughs> at, at, at this point, uh, Maury describes himself simply as an adjunct to uh, uh, Sandra. Uh, she keeps her, he keeps uh, uh, him, uh, he keeps her moving along with support. She keeps him in line and, and uh, focused as well. So uh, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome to the podium Maury Myers, uh, uh, teacher, justice, commitment, and uh, husband extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Hal, for that masterfully crafted exaggeration. <laughs> uh, but uh, my response is, I don't think I can be helpful or meaningful in any way in reciting the Declaration of Independence at your next session at the Scranton City Council. <laughs> uh, uh, some, uh, you're wondering why I'm here. Why am I standing here? I'm standing here because of Sandra. Now, how did that happen? Several months ago, we were at our dinner table, and Sandra said, turned to me and said, do you believe in free speech? And I said, uh, pondering that after decades of marriage and ha <laughs> having her thought that she had a pretty good notion of what my approach was to individual liberties, I said, yes, I do. She said, well, if you believe in free speech, you're going to give one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here, today's program gets better, much better, as we go along. Next is Len Gujan. Len is a distinguished professor here at the university and that's not misnamed. And he is, if I'm cautious, I would say he is one of the leading authorities on Ralph Waldo Emerson. And if I'm accurate, he is the leading authority on Emerson. And then we break for lunch and come back with our good friend Clement Price, who is also a distinguished professor at Rutgers University. And in addition, Clement is known as Mr. Newark in dealing with all the complexities and working towards solutions of that important urban center. And finally, we are following what is a new and welcome tradition of having members of the Yale faculty here with Thomas Pogge. And Thomas is the Leitner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs and Director of the Global Justice Program at Yale. So don't shortchange yourself, stay the entire day and have an exciting experience. The Declaration of Independence. How many have read it in the last 10 years? Oh, in preparation for this session? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, because it's, uh, it's our most revered document and seldom read. So we're going to read it today, at least a, a fair amount of it. But first, background. 1763, the French and Indian War ended, Seven, also known as the Seven Year War. Britain was established as supreme in the New World. France and Spain were shuttled off to the side, but Britain was in economic problems, largely because of the, its expenditure on this war. And the people in London said, hey, wait a minute. We spent all this money, all of this effort for these colonists. They're going to have the great potential, the great prosperity that's coming with that vastness going to the West and the natural resources. Shouldn't they pay for it? Shouldn't they pay something for it? And it made sense. So in 1765, they enacted the stamp tax. That said that a stamp had to be affixed to almost everything, to legal documents, wills, deeds, trusts, newspapers, journals, magazines, diplomas, playing cards, dice. The most expensive was sell to a lawyer's uh, license. <laughs> and the colonies said, no go. Why? It's okay for you in the British Empire to enact something that is external, that is applicable across the board to the British Empire, but you can't do it just to us. You can't do what we are calling internal taxation. Now, where was their standing on that? What right did they have to say that? Well, they had been pretty much self-governing for a long time. They had their own assemblies. They had royal governors. But the governors were appointed sometimes from the colonies themselves, sometimes from England, but they ran their own show. 
And so for the first time, they gathered in New York, these 13 different colonies, and nine, nine colonies showed up and said, we're going to protest this stamp tax. That was the first instance of collectiveness of, within the colonies, although there was some effort some years before by Benjamin Franklin, but it really didn't succeed. And they said, we're going to send off a protest to the crown. They did. And what happened was the merchants in London got very nervous. They said, we have this great market in the United States and it's going to enlarge. We're selling all kinds of consumer products there. Undo that legislation. And so they went uh, to the parliament and the parliament rescinded the stamp tax. It was never really implemented. But at the same time, they enacted what was called the Declaratory Act, which said that Parliament is supreme across the whole realm of the British Empire, and they used the phrase, in all cases whatsoever. So taxation kind of dribbled on, it continued. It was taxation on lead, on paint, on paper, uh, on tea, um, and there's rumblings in the in the colonies. And for the next nine years, they faced this dilemma of we want to express ourselves in a, a very meaningful and severe way of challenging the kind of legislation that is enacted against us, but we don't want to overthrow the government. The one thing that remained common throughout the colonies was their allegiance to the crown. And yet in 1773, the East Indies Tea Company, which was faltering, uh, sought assistance in London, and they said, we know how to answer this. Rather than have the tea which we gather in India shipped to London and Liverpool and wherever, and then to the colonies, we'll si send it direct to the colonies and we'll impose a tax. Now the net impact of that may very well have been that it cost less for the tea after they rearranged it than before. But again, the colony said, no tax. And Sam Adams, a fiery, fervent leader of the independence movement in Massachusetts with his second cousin John, organized a group in the December of 1773, 70 white men dressed up as Indians boarded three ships in the Boston port and broke open the chests and poured all that tea into the water. Parliament said, no go. We're going to impose uh, severe penalties on you. We're going to enact what we call the intolerable or the coercive acts which you have to pay for the tea that you did. Uh, we're going to uh, have restrictions on the Boston Harbor and other kinds of uh, limitations. The rumbling continues. And so in September of 1774, the first Continental Congress meets. That's the first real effort of all the, uh, uh, of all the colonies together get together. Um, the stamp tax was limited in its application, but now they said we have to deal with the problems. Of the 13 colonies, 12 came. Georgia did not, and it begged off saying, we are having problems with Indians on our frontier, and the British are giving us military assistance. Excuse us from this. So they met in September just for six weeks and sent off all kinds of resolves to the Crown about what their complaints were, and uh, indicated that if they didn't, they didn't have action, they would gather again next year in May of 1775. In the meantime, in April of 1775, you have Lexington and Concord. Now you're at war. And later on, you skirmishes which uh, the colonies said, hey, we can win this, uh, we can win this war. 
and then later Bunker Hill, which was a Pyrrhic victory for the British. Uh, they lost great numbers of people, and uh, they uh, conducted themselves in a very extreme and perverted way in which they were actually bayoneting win wounded milit milit militant men while they were on the, on the ground. So back they come in 1775 to the Second Continental Congress with two purposes, one to organize an army and two to select the leader of that army. The second was easy. Everyone knew who, the, who was going to be the commander of the army. And um, they started to move on that. At the same time, there was a considerable resistance in the colonies to breaking out, particularly in the middle colonies. They said, let's go slow. Let's not do anything. So they sent off to, in July of 1775, they sent off what was called the Olive Petition to the King George III. George had been in for 16 years as the um, King of England and continued for 44 more years, uh, 60 years total king. So um, George III refused to even look at it. And in August of a, a, uh, 1775 said, colonies, you're in rebellion. You no longer have the protection of the crown. Now, what's the relationship between uh, subjects and uh, uh, the monarch? It's the subjects pledge allegiance to the monarch, and the monarch says, I will protect your person and your property. George said, you're out. And in November of 1775, which became a huge issue, the royal governor in Virginia, Lord Dunmore, unrelated to our distinguished <laughs> borough a mile away, <laughs> said to the slaves in the South, run away, come join us in our military effort and you'll be free. Followed in January of 1776 by a recent immigrant, one who had been in the country for only 15 months, wrote a paper which, in which hundreds of thousands were distributed. Well over a million people read it and Thomas Paine's common sense became the rallying cry. Now this Continental Congress is meeting and it starts getting bombarded with declarations of independence. Declarations from states, from colonies, from boroughs, from townships, from private groups, and it's building. In May, May 15th of 1776, the Virginia General Assembly directs its delegation to the Continental Congress. Now all these delegates to this Continental Congress were instructed what to do. They had no freedom of choice on their own. They instructed them to declare an independence. And so on June 7th, Richard Henry Lee of the famous Lees of Virginia, a very elegant and skilled man, rose and read a proclamation. Now in your papers, we have three items. The first item is his resolution. What did he say? It's just a part of a page here. You got it? He said, resolved that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Two other aspects that he said. The second was that it is expedient forthwith to take the most effectual measures for forming foreign alliances, and I'll mention that briefly. And the third was that a plan of confederation be prepared and transmitted to the respective colonies for their consideration and approbation. So here's before this Continental Congress a resolution that says, hey, we're independent. Now the lineup is 
The New England states strongly supported that. Virginia, the most important colony, su vigorously supported it. The middle states, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland said go slow. We're very uh, concerned about that. And that group was led by John Dickinson of Pennsylvania, who said we can still work it out with the king. What it is we want is we want to get in, we don't want to get, get out. So here is Lee's uh, resolution, and there's nervousness. And June 8th, they debate it. June 9th is a Sunday, day off. June 10th, they come back, and they say, all right, I think we know what we want, want to do here. We want to appoint a committee and give that committee three weeks to prepare a declaration, and then, in the meantime, we'll be discussing its merits, and when it comes back, if the decision is made to seek independence, we're ready to go. So the committee is appointed. John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, the most well, the best known person in all the colonies, Thomas Jefferson, a young man in his 30s who's known as a very skilled writer and a lousy speaker, <laughs> uh, Roger Sherman, who is the only, uh, he and Robert Morris are the only people who signed the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution, and Robert Livingston, the lineup. Adams from Massachusetts and Sherman from Connecticut, two New Englanders. Franklin from Pennsylvania, Livingston from New York, two middle states, and a Virginian. Now, the question is, who's going to be the author of this Declaration of Independence? There was some indication, in this, historically, that Benjamin Franklin was requested, and he said, wait a minute, I'm too old, I'm too ill, and furthermore, I don't work with committees. <laughs> uh, uh, so Adams goes to Jefferson. Now, the the discussion between Adams and Jefferson is pretty well documented based on Adams' notes. And Adams says to Jefferson three things. He says, Jefferson, you should be the author of this document because I'm obnoxious. <laughs> you're gentle, you're serene, you should do it. Furthermore, you can write 10 times better than I can and lastly, understanding the whole political balance of it, you're a Virginian. Jefferson didn't want it. His uh, mother had passed away recently. His wife was undergoing a difficult pregnancy. He had migraine headaches. He was really interested in working on the Virginia Constitution. As a matter of fact, he said, my country, Virginia. Um, so he took it and he um, consulted somewhat with Franklin and Adams. They had limited observations on his draft. Back it came on the end of June and the Continental Congress votes on July 2nd to adopt and implement Richard Henry Lee's resolution. They are now independent. July 2nd, and Adams writes to his Abigail and says, this is the day that we will remember in history. This is the day that we will observe with fireworks and parades and bonfires, and he was correct. It was the day in which they, uh, independence was declared, July 2nd. I don't think we're going to undo historically that here in this next uh, few minutes. Uh, now they debated the Declaration of Independence, 
And on July 4th in the evening, uh, they did a good job cutting away a lot of Jefferson's product. And Jefferson was, Jefferson was very dismayed. And we'll take a look at one of the things that they cut out. But they enacted the Declaration of Independence. So let's now take a look at it. It's item number two, two there. Uh, you see it? Did everybody got the Declaration? Uh, it says in Congress, July 4, 1776, the first line below that is the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. It was not unanimous. Uh, New York abstained, abstained because it didn't have instructions from its delegates, uh, from its General Assembly. And furthermore, there were many delegates that did not support, uh, support it. The next thing where it says, of the 13 united, you see united, it's in a small u. It is not suggesting that these colonies are in any way a new political creation. They're united only in the terms of their position of declaration here. They're not a, um, they're not a sovereign body because they had given, been given very express instructions from their assemblies, do not whatever you do, put together a new body. Your instructions are, go independent, but do not create a new entity. All right, now there are five sections to the declaration. There is the, inter by the way, that, that's a question on, some say there are three, some say there are four. The National Archives says five, so we'll call it five. Um, what, what's the difference? Well, for example, the first two paragraphs they lump together. However, the National Archive says the first paragraph is the introduction, the second paragraph is the preamble, then we go into the charges, the grievances against the king, then we deal with the denouncing of the people in England who didn't take action, and finally the conclusion. The first paragraph. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people, now there it would kind of indicate that there's, there's a, a, a solidness there, to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God. Jefferson was very careful. He just didn't want to have, say, the laws of nature. He wanted to have a, a God reference in there. Entitle them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Why? Why do we have a Declaration of Independence? Here, when people break out from alliances, they break out. When uh, on July 2nd, when they declared they were independent, isn't that final? What else did you need? Why do you, are we going through this document when the act has actually occurred? It's the act that should be observed, not the writings that follow it. Why? Well, why? It believed that it could win the war, the colonists. But it also believed that it needed assistance from particularly France, and to some extent Spain, needed existence. France and Spain would look at these colonists and say, hey, wait a minute, you're a bunch of rebels. You really don't want to break out from it. You want to come, go get in. You want representation. You want to go the other way. You're going to have some skirmishes here, and then you're going to kiss and make up. And who are we? We're, we helped you. All you were were a bunch of rebels. And you're back with the same family. They felt that the only way they could declare the permanence of their position was to have a document that clearly said, we're finished. And so we have a Declaration of Independence. The second paragraph, the paragraph that now remains, the paragraph that we all know to some uh, extent, and partic particularly the first 55 words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. 
self-evident. That means axiomatic. That with, it requires nothing further. It's like the law of, law of gravity. That all men are created equal. That's proposition number one there. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Incidentally, in the first printing of that, it was correctly inalienable, and in its uh, reprinting, somehow got transferred into unalienable. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if you were Patrick Henry, you would say that sequence is a little bit reversed. He who said, give me liberty or give me death, would have said liberty first. Liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, why didn't it say life, liberty, and property, which was the standard reference at that time and also is the reference even today, even in our uh, 14th Amendment, it says life, liberty, and property. Why didn't Jefferson say property and substitute for that pursuit of happiness? Incidentally, he doesn't talk about happiness. He talks about the pursuit of it. Um, uh, why? Well, a couple of explanations. One is... There were the Tories, um, of which the Loyalists, of which it was estimated there were at least 35 to 40 percent of those in the colony, uh, they thought that they might be seizing their property. So they didn't want to have uh, established the right of property when they're going to go out and perhaps take the property. Second reason is, probably even more compelling, is that Slavery. What were slaves? Were slaves persons or were they property? Um, if you read Federalist Paper 54, it says they're both in our, fam uh, our infamous three-fifths provision in just trying to justify that. It says slaves are both persons and property. They can be bought, sold, um, transferred, uh, willed, uh, uh, et cetera. So Jefferson did not want to get into that issue of preserving that relationship, even though he was, had over 200 slaves himself, bought and sold them, and never freed any until his death when he freed, it's not clear whether it was three or five of his hundreds of slaves, and not Sally Hennings. Uh, so we... Pursuit of happiness. Now, to secure these rights, the go governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Here's the other application that is so relevant and relied on by uh, people referencing the Declaration of Independence in subsequent uh, uh, years. All right. Um, that. So what have we established? We've established that they're endowed, they're, all men are equal, they're endowed with uh, rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and they get these powers from the consent of the governed. However, they go on and say that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of people to alter, to abolish it. What are they talking about there? Revolution. Jefferson was an advocate of revolution, and he even said that it perhaps should happen every 20 years. <laughs> Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient reasons. Don't be hasty about it, and accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while even evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations Pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce him under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off, throw off, revolt such government and to provide new guards. Such has been the patient suffering, we've been patient, and each is now the necessity which constrains them to alter the former systems of government. The history of the present King of England. Now, that's important to focus. They are not challenging monarchy. As a matter of fact, there was a movement in this country to make George Washington king. They're not challenging monarchy, but they are challenging the king of England, King George III, the specific uh, monarch. The history of the present king of 
Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny. And then he says, pursue these facts. And he goes through what is then the guts of the, of the Declaration of Independence. All of this is some abstraction that nobody's paying any attention to. This was absolutely meaningless. The first paragraph, the explanation of why. The second paragraph, which is all that remains of the Declaration, had no consequence, no impact whatsoever at the time. You wonder, why was it even inserted? Um, then we go through, and there are 28 different grievances. Now, you'll note that these grievances don't have any time, they don't have any place, they don't have any location. They're very general charges. The first one, he has refused to assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. That is, their explanation is that he's interfering with the process of our local colonies governing themselves. Number four, for example, he has called together legislative bodies at place unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with its measures. What is that? That is believed to be that he moved where the General Assembly of Massachusetts met from Boston to Cambridge in 1768. And John Adams said, that's got to go into this system of grievances. You look on number seven. He's endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, destructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners. See, they had a whole notion of welcoming immigration, and the king was resisting that uh, because they had this whole vastness out there of the West unknown. How, how far did it go? We know it went to another ocean, but what was going to happen there? But we have such potential that they wanted um, immigra immigrants coming in, and he uh, resisted it. Eight and nine deal with the judiciary. The, read number nine, he's made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. And we now know that judges have given terms in our federal system, life terms, and you can't reduce their salaries in the course of the terms. Number 10, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and out their substance. And this is kind of poppycock. He's talking about the, how extravagant they were with no itemization of it. 11, 12, 14, and 15, we're talking about standing armies, and that was a critical issue. Uh, and military forces in the uh, colonies it resulted in our second amendment, which we all know, and our third amendment, which prohibits quartering of soldiers. Thirteen, that's the guts of it. This is the guts of it. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation Who's he talking about there? He doesn't use the word, but he's talking about Parliament. And the, uh, um, if you look at number 17, it illustrates what he's talking about there, the reference that we constantly uh, hear about for imposing taxes on us without our consent, taxation without representation. Uh, going on to... Uh, 23 through 27, that's the, the conduct that he made. He, he made war on us. Uh, um, 23, he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and wage, waging war against us. That's when I said in August of 1775, he declared you were in rebellion and out of our protection. That's to what they're referring to. Now, 25. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of uh, death, desolation, and tyranny. Uh, this drove them crazy, the hiring of the German Hessians. And it also gave them the legitimateness to say, you're hiring Germans, you're hiring the Hessians, then we can go to France and to Spain and say, help us. Uh, but this uh, 
was something that was uh, uh, equally offensive with Lord Dunmore's proclamation to free the slaves if they joined him in the military effort. 27, he has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring us, uh, bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Now this is extreme irony. Here are the colonists exploiting the Indians in our country, and he's talking about these merciless savages that uh, 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 he's, uh, he, the King George III, has excited uh, to take all of these uh, uh, destructive acts on us. And then in 28, he says, hey, we've tried. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress, and you haven't heard. You haven't. Then the next paragraph, which is the one that deals with the with the uh, uh, failure of their British cousins to respond, he says, nor have we been wanting to attention to our British brethren, etc. So the final paragraph, we therefore, the representatives of the United, again, small you, they're very careful not to say we're uh, in some way a solidified body, in General Congress Assembly, appealing to the Supreme Judge that that was an assertion by the Congress itself. Jefferson didn't have that in there. He had very little reference to um, um, religi religiously of the world for rectitude of our intention, due in the name and authority of our good people, there it's a capital P, uh, of these colonies, sol solemnly pub publish and declare that these united, again, small u, are and of right, ought to be free and independent <coughs> states, each one free and independent. We're not a collective body that they are absolved and they recite uh, what Richard Henry Lee said in his resolution. Uh, that was signed uh, by John Hancock on July 4th and the secretary, and there's folklore that Han Hancock signed it so large that the king would, wouldn't have to put on his spectacles, that's folklore. It wasn't signed by the, uh, wasn't signed by the remaining delegates of 56 until sometime in August. So, what is the impact following the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence? Where where did it go and what does it mean today? After it was enacted, it went into mothballs. There was no more reason to follow it. Uh, why? Its mission had been accomplished. Independence was now established. And furthermore, it, was, it had no capacity to implement, um, uh, implement anything. But beyond that, what it was was a challenge to monarchs. Now, who had helped them? France and Spain, both run by monarchs. They didn't want to uh, enter into conflict with those and, but even more significant, it was a diatribe against King George. He continued to be the King of England from 1776 to 1820 for 44 years. Here is the country with which they're going to establish political, social, cultural, economic relationships, and they're calling the King a bum. <laughs> it's an embarrassment now. The declaration, they want to hide. Um, so it is, does not appear, the Declaration of Independence does not appear in the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't appear in the Federalist Papers, those 85 papers of hundreds of pages, except for a single footnote in one paper. It doesn't even appear in Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. It's submerged. And Beyond that, it continues to be submerged because who is elected president of the United States the first time? George Washington. He gets 100% of the electoral vote. Who's re-elected? George Washington. He gets 100% of the electoral vote. There is no need for political parties. After Washington, 
there is, is now comes into prominence the Federalist Party, led by Hamilton and Adams and John Jay, and the Democrat Republican Party, led by Jefferson and Madison. And the Federalists say, we're not going to give any dignity, we're not going to give any recognition to that guy who was the author of the Declaration of Independence. So again, they do everything to really obscure the Declaration. In the meantime, countries are saying, hey, these guys won a war. They got their independence. We're going to begin to follow the. We're going to have our own declaration, Haiti in 1804. Other countries in South America, particularly at that time. But after the War of 1812, the Declaration of Independence came back into prominence. And you had, in 1819, the Missouri Compromise. What was the Missouri Compromise? Missouri said, we're a territory. We now want to become a state. And to become a state, you had to have a, a sufficient population and stability. Missouri qualified. There was one problem. There were 22 states in the country. 11 were slaveholding, and 11 were free. Missouri comes in, and the balance is tipped. So they finally say, OK, we think we have an answer. We'll chop off Maine from Massachusetts, bring Maine in. That's a free state. We'll bring Missouri in. But the argument was, uh, by the abolitionists, hey, didn't this document say all men are created equal, and we got slavery? And the slaveholder said, didn't it said that you get your just powers from the consent of the governed? Missouri wants to come in as a state. Missouri did come in as a state and did establish uh, a semi-permanence of slavery in this country, at least for many decades. John C. Calhoun in the 1830s talked about nullification, nullification which says any state can uh, nullify, declare void, any statute that the federal government enacts which has application to it, to the state. Why? Consent of the governed. Uh, your Declaration of Independence said so. And if you think nullification is a lost issue, 10 days ago, in the state of Missouri, Missouri uh, general, uh, legislature enacted a law that said there can be no, we, there can be no federal crime on gun control, there can be no federal gun control legislation affecting Missouri. And furthermore, any federal officer who attempts to utilize or rely on that is guilty of a crime in Missouri. Passes the Missouri legislature, goes to the governor, he vetoes it, says, hey, it's clearly unconstitutional. Goes back to the Missouri legislature. The General Assembly overwhelmingly approves it. They need two-thirds. The Senate of Missouri, by one vote, didn't get the two-thirds. One vote, or Missouri would have been nullifying laws even today, relying on the Declaration of, of Independence. So during the Abraham Lincoln, where did he stand on all of this, on the Declaration of Independence? Uh, he was slow in coming about, but he th finally said, all of my political feelings arrive and derive from the sentiment embodied in the Declaration of Independence. His Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago, 87 years is what he talked about. 87 years from 1863 takes it back to 1776. Not to the Constitution, to the Declaration of Independence. But he meets a roadblock. 1857, Dred Scott case. Chief Justice Roger Taney says, uh, not only are blacks not citizens and never can be citizens, but the Declaration of Independence has no application to them. And so what, do we, what, what happens post that? We enact the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment 
abolishing slavery, the 14th Amendment, talking about equal protection. Uh, you're a citizen of both the national government and the states, due process of law. And the 15th, saying the uh, right to vote is you can't be deprived based on race. But then, after reconciliation, again, the Declaration of Independence was obscured. Uh, as it felt, the uh, South and the North are getting together. It's better off not to bring this up. So wh how, why is it that this document is, it's an unlikely document to become an advocate for our moral standards. Uh, why? As I said, it completed its mission of accomplishing independence at the time. The other paragraphs, the first two paragraphs, they were abstractions. They were, af they were afterthoughts. They weren't heeded in any way by uh, people. But what happened is that uh, the people who enacted it, the 56 who enacted it, whether they intended to or not, created a vision of liberty and equality. Uh, and as time went on, this moved, the Declaration moved, from a document justifying revolution to one in which said, the moral standards of the country should be measured in part by reference to, to this document. Uh, was it heated for a time? No, because uh, particularly in governance, governance excluded. It excluded blacks, it excluded women, it, it, it excluded uh, uh, propertyless people, it excluded Native Americans, it excluded indentured, it excluded to a large extent Catholics and Jews, but it was constantly then respected and re looked to as an item of reverence. And those groups that relied on it was expanded. Gays in today, disabled people, children's advocates, um, additional minority groups, uh, Muslims, Asians, Hispanics. So I say that the question today is, why and how did this document, which really dealt with the separation of a people from a sovereign, become one which challenges us not only to be what we were, but uh, demands of us to be what we ought to be? Thank you. Side. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 there are multiple, uh, there are multiple copies, and they went out. There was, was called like the Fair, F A I R, uh, Declaration, which was relied on, uh, and there are several, and so there are some discrepancies, but uh, substantively, uh, they're they're not. Uh, yes, Len. Lori, when you were pointing out the reason for this uh, document, since it came after the fact of actual Declaration of Independence, its function was to assure potential allies like France that this was a solid commitment yes. uh, to independence. Uh, is it possible also, especially in light of your final remarks, that the purpose and function of the document was to win the minds and the hearts of colonists who were undecided about the issue of independence? and that the abstract portion of it, establishing the fundamental nature of universal human rights, would be the most appealing part of that. Yeah, absolutely. You're right on target, Len. As I said, there were estimated up to 40% of the people. 
And John Dickinson, who was the leader uh, of it, he had an interesting twist on that. When the Pennsylvania delegation first voted on the declaration, it was five to four against. Now, somebody must have worked on Dickinson. Uh, it was four to three against, four to three against. Somebody must have worked on Dickinson, and Dickinson um, said, okay, what I'm gonna do when it comes up again for a vote, I'm going to vote to, I'm not gonna vote, I'm gonna abstain. And I'm gonna get Robert Morris with me to vote. So the four to three against went to three to two in favor because of Dickinson. Was he influenced in part by this, exactly this, and the, and, and the deliberations, yes. And Dickinson, within eight days after his, uh, uh, this uh, July 4th, presented to the Continental Congress a draft of the Articles of Confederation, influenced largely by this. So are you correct on that? 100%. Yes, it did inf influence not only the colonists, but those who were at the, uh, at the Constitutional Convention. Yes. Yeah, Bob. Maury, uh, Franklin and Jefferson <coughs> and uh, Adams, I guess, they yeah. spent considerable time in France. Uh, to what extent did the Declaration derive from principles established by the French Revolution? Well, it, it preceded the French Revolution. The French Revolution would say it was they influenced they, by, right. by the, by the uh, de right. Declaration. And, um, um, they, uh, some people call this uh, declaration really uh, a Franco-filed document that it was, uh, was exactly for that reason because of its, the sentiments expressed in there and the limited challenge only to K King George. Uh, but uh, uh, the French, there were French who would say the declaration influenced us, the, the reverse of that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes, uh, Kevin. Uh, on, on that last issue, I've always been puzzled because um, they say, scholars say, the greatest product of the Enlightenment was the French Revolution, and, and yet the American Declaration of Independence and, and Revolution seems to antedate that a little bit. I, I, I don't know why they, they don't mm -hmm. mention that. Is it because they're Euro Eurocentric? scholars that are yeah. talking about the Enlightenment. Yeah, but you'll find, Kevin, you'll find that this Declaration of Independence has been followed, you say, by over a hundred nations. As I said, starting with Haiti in 1804, uh, even going up to uh, uh, Israel in 1848. So th this Declaration had uh, uh, quite pr uh, cons considerable prominence around the world, um, once it became clear that this group could win the war. Now, you might ask the question, well, how, how, what made them feel that they could win the war? Uh, they, uh, there were several reasons why they did, because here they're taking on the greatest military force in existence in world history at that time. Uh, how are they gonna do it? They said, first, the logistics. England, they have to get on their boats and they have to come here and they have to uh, spend weeks traveling uh, with all that dissipation of energy and, and developing illness and all of that. Um, that's a huge liability to it. Second reason they say is we got 1,200 miles of a coast. Where are they gonna, f are they gonna fight us in Charleston or are they gonna fight us in, uh, uh, in Jamestown? Are they gonna fight us in New York? Are they gonna fight us in Boston? Where are they? And then th what they said was interesting, we know how to use firearms. We have a history of dealing with uh, uh, hunting. We have a history of dealing with Indians. Those guys have a tradition of Hip, line up, okay, fire, next group, stand up. And uh, we are much more equipped in this, uh, in this 1,200 mile terrain to do this so that although historians talk about it as a miracle, uh, it's become m somewhat more 
uh, susceptible now to recognition that they had a lot going for them in this military conflict. Yeah. Sid. Or to the extent that there was news media in European capitals, and to the extent the what? that there was popular opinion in European capitals, well, was there any effect of popular opinion in London, Paris, Madrid? Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, William Pitt, Edmund Burke stood up in the parliament and said, what the hell are you guys doing here? Um, recognize them. And the irony is, so there was strong support uh, in, in the parliament and with the, uh, uh, with the British people. And as I said, the British people wanted this because they had this market here that they were talking about. So the merchants' interests. Now, um, you might ask the reverse of that. Why did the middle states, why were they so resistant when there are the Adams boys up there hollering, let's get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. And in Virginia, uh, uh, certainly Patrick Henry, George Mason, George Washington, those guys are saying, call it quits. Why did the middle states resist that? Well, for one thing, they didn't feel the impact of it. The wars were taking place up in New England and down south. It wasn't uh, yet. And the second thing is, there was a whole diversified population. It, it wasn't as homogeneous in the middle states. You had Quakers, you had, Yuga, you had a, a, a varied population. So uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they were much less enthused about doing this. Uh, so, but yes, you had in England strong, strong support. Pitt and Burke led the, uh, um, led the demand for resolve this thing, and if you can't resolve it, let them go. But uh, uh, George, who's depicted as a total tyrant, uh, by the way, there's just one thing there, uh, I forgot, number three. Number three, let me just give you that to show you uh, item number three is, is uh, the longest, you have that, that's on slavery, the slave trade. Here's what, here's what Jefferson wanted that didn't get in. Let's read it. He, it's the longest section of any of the grievances. He, King George, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred right of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivated and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. He's saying George is the guy who brought the slaves into uh, uh, the colonies, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. It was estimated that one-third of the slaves who were put aboard in Africa died along the way. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is a warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. He has prostituted his negative, that means he vetoed, for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this ex execrable commerce determining to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, and this assemblage of whores might want no fact of distinguished die. I have no idea what that phrase means. <laughs> he is now exciting, he is now exciting these very people to rise in arms among us. He's referencing uh, Dunmore's uh, uh, proclamation of come free and run away and you're free, and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people upon whom he also obtruded them, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges. This is an absurdity. He's bl blaming King George for the slave trade. Now he's not talking about slavery. He's talking about the slave trade. And here it is that the southerners importing with the northerners and the shipping interests uh, like the Brown brothers up in Rhode Island, for whom Brown University is named, uh, conducting all kinds of transportation, benefiting in a huge way, and he's saying, King George, you're responsible for this. Um, now, what happened was that South Carolina and Georgia said, no go. We won't go along with you, and we won't join in this cause if you don't eliminate that. So it never got in. But it's 
seems to me crazy that this guy Jefferson, the holder of hundreds of slaves, is talking about eliminate the slave trade. I have my own theory of why he said it, but it's an amateur historian and not worthy of your <laughs> discussion yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> what? What's my theory? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my theory is this, that uh, there was Virginia, the most important colony uh, of the 13 at the time. Um, it was the largest in numbers. It was the largest in slaves. It had the largest number of leaders. Um, what was its product? Its product was tobacco. Tobacco is very demanding on the, on the uh, land. It's a hard, you can't repeat too much. So it's a, it's a product that extinguishes itself. And here's, uh, uh, here's Virginia with its large number of slaves and its product is going out of style. Uh, cotton hadn't yet come into existence, but there was sugar and rice and other things in southern states. They were, and uh, he, uh, Jefferson was saying, what do we do with all these slaves? We have to support them for the rest of their lives? Let's, let's sell them. But if we sell them, we're competing with that market that they're importing them that's cheaper for them to bring them in for us to sell them. So I think Jefferson may have been saying, hey, I'm challenging the slave trade of the king because I, I want uh, the Virginians to have a market to get rid of their slaves. Don't, don't rely too much on it. Steve. Maury, you um, uh, alluded to the, uh, when you're describing the phrase, they're endowed by their creator, you said that was put in by Jefferson. Yes. Uh, no, no. Where in the uh, Declaration itself, yes. th that was put in by the, by the uh, Continental Congress. And also, at, towards the end, Prov um, the reference to um, Providence, the Supreme Judge of the yeah, World. Yeah. Could you comment a little on uh, the references to the deity in here and uh, in the context of the current, um, our current political climate in which some people claim uh, that the founders uh, were founding a religious nation? Uh, we're founding a religious nation. Well, many of the many of the founders were deists. They said, "There's a supreme being, but the supreme being puts you on this earth, and you exercise your own will. You're on your own after that." Uh, and as you know, many of them were not affiliated with any uh, uh, religious de uh, de denominations. So. Uh, uh, I don't see this as a, I see him very carefully when he says at the beginning, nature and nature's God. He's really saying natural law, but by the way, I better be protective here by talking about not just natural law, but law through God. Uh, so that's an ins insertion. I think, but the other insertions were by the, uh, uh, were by, uh, particularly at the end, the supreme, uh, providence and supreme judge were insertions that were uh, uh, demanded by the uh, uh, other members. He was he steered pretty much away from a religious document, and uh, uh, they put it in. Now uh, uh, that was part of the political game to say, "Hey, uh, we better recognize our interests here. We have a." Uh, um, we have enough of a problem with several states balking. We better not raise the, uh, uh, we better at least be comfortable to those who want identification with uh, a religious reference. That's about all I can say on it, yeah. Yeah, Matt. Um, do you know, uh, was it, like with the, the crown in France and Spain, was there any attempt by them to try and get the allegiance of the colonists towards their crown? And was there any sentiment in the colonies of actually just switching allegiance to a crown, like to France or to uh, Spain during this time? I don't think, uh, well, I think there was allegiance post that in terms of the French struggle and uh, uh, you know the pr French Revolution. I think there was identification. But I don't think there was any significant uh, uh, identification with that. What they were saying is, hey, we know France is an enemy of England. We know Spain is an enemy of England. We know 
that uh, they would be very uh, agreeable to helping us if they thought we were bona fide. And th it was really more of a military alliance than anything else. I don't think there was any kind of, uh, any kind of identification uh, there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. But, by the way, just one last comment. As I'm walking up here, Hal Bailey, I didn't have a watch, gave me his watch. Do you think that was suggestive of something? <laughs> I got to... Just because he forced it on you? No. <laughs> thank you, everyone. We're... Uh, uh, take a break now, but be sure to be back by about um, three minutes before 11 so that we can be on time.